So it's well, really it, not. It, it's not so much the absolute value of the grams of protein too. It's the it's the mixture of the of the of the amino acids in the protein. Because my understanding is that leucine is really a key trigger for this muscle muscle growth, and you need about two grams at least two grams and maybe up to four to six grams after an intensive work, workout to build muscle growth. And I just don't know the concentration of the leucines or some of the other branch chain amino acids in some of those protein supplements you, you recommended. Is, is leucine well, high? I'm going to go back to the Francis uh, Moore LePay's, you know, uh, kind of thing about protein combining and say that she was wrong and she admits she's wrong um, many years ago. And the reason is in, in Guyton's physiology, it's clear that the, all the proteins are kind of stored in the liver. I mean, the amino acids are stored in the liver. So I kind of feel that what, what happens is we build that up over over time, that we have that storage, and it's called upon. Um, it doesn't mean we don't have to have the, the, the protein supply, but um, for some, you know, that's so I'm kind of saying that, that uh, over time, we are storing a lot of those things so we can call upon them for instant use for the muscle building. Um, that's my kind of take on that, and that, that's really based on on that whole principle that in Guyton's physiology, which we both studied, you know, that it's stored in the liver and the amino acids that are, are, are brought out to it. And, and I'm not sure that immediately afterwards does it. I'm not saying it doesn't, because I, I do eat immediately afterwards, and I will have, you know, my kind of thing of protein, which is more... Uh, the bee pollen and three tablespoons of bee pollen and a few things like that in the morning. So uh, um, when do you exercise? You just probably do it in the morning too? Or? No, it varies. It depends on where I am in the, at the at specific season. So in the winter, I'm typically in a subtropical environment and, uh, and not really in a work mode as much. So typically exercise oh, okay. in, the, in the morning, but when I'm in the summer, I'll exercise in the afternoon. But I think ah, ideally yeah. for me, okay. if I had a choice and I was in a in, in an environment where I didn't have any restrictions on my time, I'd probably exercise in the morning. Yeah, but that that's how I do it. And anyway, so that's how I get my protein. And uh, but I, I I think ultimately, if you're getting that total during the day, uh, you have them actually. You, you then utilize them when you need it for building. Now that's my own theory, but that's how I've seen it work for me. Okay. Well, it you know it's somewhat of a tangent, so we probably have some other, yeah, yeah. other more important. But it's a fair and it's a fair and a good question. I, I don't know. Um, exactly. Well, let me ask. Let me let me ask this. I, I I've got a good way to wrap it. So, so Dr. McCullough, what what do you think about maybe some of the other nutrients uh, that you can get from uh, animal products that would would benefit um, not just protein, since we're talking about protein? Well, I'd like to finish up your other question first because I think it was an important one. And uh, I think okay. Dr. Cousins and I are both in agreement that eggs are a phenomenal food and, you know, relatively uh, amenable to most people who choose a vegetarian lifestyle because, you know, they're not really killing an animal for the most part. Uh, at least that's my understanding of it. And it's a phenomenally complete food. Uh, I personally have a minimum of two eggs a day, and more typically four, and sometimes as much as eight eggs a day. And they're, the key to, to consuming them is I, I have them raw and un uncooked, and, which I think is a really guiding principle in eating. And you know, I think that we both agree on is that the, the majority of your food should be cooked raw, uh, because when you, when you heat them, you're going to damage some of the really important nutrients. So, you know, I, I think egg, egg, whole eggs, not just the egg yolk or the egg white, but the whole eggs consumed at once, eaten raw, would, would be one of the most phenomenal proteins you can get. So if one's consuming that, you know, it, it, and actually, it, it's kind of getting back to your early question of position, the reason why I was so vigorously opposed to the China study is I'm opposed to any position which, which preaches one specific diet for everyone. And, and that was really what the foundation with the China study is doing. It says no one should eat animal protein. So, you know, and I'm not saying, I don't say the converse, that everyone should eat animal protein. I'm saying that you have to individualize it. So I, you know, if, if someone who is, eat, is consuming raw eggs on a regular basis and then choose not to eat any other forms, forms of animal protein, I, I'm pretty convinced the vast majority of those people would never really suffer any complications but when you remove all animal protein i think you have to be somewhat concerned and you have to be really vigilant as 
as I think we both agree, specifically vitamin B12 and some of the other nutrients that Dr. Cousins can discuss because he really monitors people with the, who choose this type of lifestyle, and he's got a lot more clinical experience than I do. But I think you have to be vigilant when you, when you make the decision to exclude all sources of animal protein from your diet. I want to actually agree with what you're saying. I have to tell you, I can't stand eggs, but that's me. Mm -hmm. But um, well, sure. Some people are allergic to them. They shouldn't have them. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've never been able to eat eggs in my life. They make me nauseated. But but my point is a little different. The principles you're saying are absolutely correct, from my point of view. You've got to individualize. And I want to say, if you're going to be successful at a live food plant source only, you have to be a lot more diligent. Not a little bit. You have to be a lot more. And I I say it this way: You want to play with jet fuel? Got to go to jet pilot school. It. it definitely takes more uh, focus and attention if you're going to do plant source only. And that's, I want to agree with that. Eggs are a, you know, powerful and uh, if you cook them, according to the Max Planck Institute, you're going to lose 50, you're going to coagulate 50% of the protein. I don't, I happen to agree with you, we, I think I agree with you, that cholesterol isn't such a big deal. Um, in fact, my often concern with, um, Plant source only people, they're too low in cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I don't give them coconut oil and coconut. I, you, would you agree with that, that cholesterol isn't such a big deal? You know, well, I, cholesterol, I high cholesterol is not a big deal from the perspective of being a risk factor for heart disease for most people. That's what it's, I'm saying. That's yeah, what I'm it's saying. most of the ratio of the good to bad cholesterol, which usually is correlated with high cholesterol. So, But you have to look at this, yeah. the details and the yeah. specific lipoprotein subfractions but and right. other risk factors. But but when you do have low cholesterol, that is an independent risk factor for, the, for the other cool. issues because it's a precursor yeah. for the steroid hormones. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And what we get is literally uh, – uh, significant amount more depression and suicide. Mm -hmm. Sure, that um, makes sense. And a whole lot less, uh, I'm going to say, steroid function, hormonal function, not good. Much more depression on low. So I'm often treating uh, plant source only people with coconut oil and, uh, you know, coconut butter and things to raise the cholesterol. That actually I see happen a little bit more often than is comfortable to me. So I think that, 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 that men and women need to be... Uh, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, high-density lipoproteins. And so that is a problem that sometimes show up. So I want to agree, let's go with agreement, is, hey, if you're going to do plants or something, you must be more vigilant. You've got to pay a lot more attention, and that's what I do. If you don't do that, you do run into trouble. So I think that's an important thing. Now, I'm going to say from the spiritual point of view, yoga will tell you that eggs are... Uh, tend to lower consciousness. You know, they call it the menstruation of the hen. You know, it doesn't really appealing, but that's kind of what the teaching is. And so in a yoga tradition, for uh, kind of spiritual life, they don't see it that way. Now, we're talking many levels, but egg on a plate straight thing, it, it's a good protein if they eat it raw. And you have both the, the yolk and, and, and the white part, you know. So yeah, and we're, and we're making the assumption that it's from a healthy source. It's sort of the underlying assumption for all of our recommendations is, is to, yeah. you know, not to use a factory farmed egg where they're given antibiotics and hormones and the chickens aren't ever allowed to see the light of day. You know, this is not the type of food you want to be eating. Yeah, it, it's really bad. And I, I want to see something else about egg is there is a high percentage of salmonella and that may be more in factory farm. And that part, the research doesn't tell you when they make that statement. Well, you know, I looked at that, those... You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, that's a traditional concern, but I actually, uh, about five, six years ago, I looked into the literature, and there was a really interesting U.S. Department of Agriculture study that looked at the numbers, and they only found like 30,000 infections a year. You know, actually, the number of infections they found a year, if you divide it by the number of eggs produced, would be, put the risk at 1 in 30,000 of all eggs. That, that would, would, would includes not differentiating healthy eggs from factory farmed eggs. So it's still, still a relatively small amount of infections. Yeah, but it doesn't 000. mean we, do, we they, they don't have the bacteria. I understand what you're saying. It's a good point. But it doesn't mean they don't have the bacteria and your immune system can't fight it off. You know? Right, even if you did. Because, I mean, yeah. it's as we all know, it's not so much the bug. It's, it's the functioning of your immune system that controls whether or not you're exactly. going to become exactly. sick. So, it's, it's, so um, I think that's it. I think the big principle that... A lot of vegans don't get, you got to pay a lot more attention if you're going that way. You really do. And I'm going to add the carnosine. Um, to me, 
meat eaters don't get enough carnosine either because you eat, you eat a seven ounce steak and you're only only getting 250 milligrams of carnosine. You need about a thousand a day, and carnosine really protects, as you well know, against the glycosylation and against free radicals because any protein that gets glycosylated puts about 50 times more free radicals out there. So it, it definitely accelerates aging. So I think everybody needs carnosine for your yeah. brain and your circulatory system and, and your heart and and really your muscles, your skin, the whole system. And, and overall, you need to be less concerned about free radicals if you're having a diet that is really full of large amounts of, of high-quality high vegetables because they're loaded with antioxidants. Yeah. The whole spectrum, and, and you know, and if, they're, if you're eating them on a regular basis, they're going to be really abundant in your in your system, and you'll be able to detoxify those. Yes. So, Dr. McCullough, for, Dr. McCullough, for the everyday person, mm -hmm. you know, do, do you think, hearing what Dr. Cousins is saying here, do you think that, you know, what what do you think is the best recommendation for them? Because if they really have to focus on their studying of, of nutrition, do you think they can do it? With everything else they have to do. Well, I, I think that you know the record. Ultimately, you have to make your own choices, and, and you know, many people choose a vegan lifestyle not for health reasons, and, and I'm sure Dr. Cousins can address that. But from my experience, you know, they have some really strong moral and ethical concerns about killing animals, and, and I don't dispute that. And if you're choosing that, then you know, then that's a whole other issue. But I, th I think for whatever your choices of, of choosing that food path, you have to be very diligent and because there are health consequences for doing that. If you could choose to ignore them, but you're going to suffer and it's, and, you know, it does take a lot of extra effort and you have to implement those to, to safeguard against some of the side effects from, from, you know, potential, potential nutritional deficiencies developing from excluding animal pro protein from your diet. I would agree. I, w I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm going to tell you that all diets, animal or, or, or plant source, are deficient in minerals. 90% of pregnant women are deficient in long-chain omega-3s, and most of the population, as we well know, is are meat eaters. Okay, that's a problem. So, you know, um, B12, um, meat eaters, they did a study when I was at Columbia Medical School, it kind of blew my mind. They had people with normal B12, and... 30% of them felt immensely better when they got B12 shots, which means they were deficient. So I think that there's a lot of deficiencies in meat eaters, uh, you know, 40%, but when we get to higher levels of optimal functioning, you know, they're probably up at 80%, and, and, and plant source are probably at 90% deficiency. People want to ignore that. They're going to just run into trouble. I mean, I'm going to add another little thing, is that uh, our brains if we're not paying attention, shrink about 1% a year after about 45, 50, something like that. And B12 is really important to keep your brain from shrinking. So people want to ignore that, they're going to get into trouble. And I will say, and I think I have to be fair about it, is that meters have less trouble, but they're still, if you're running at 40 or 50 or 80%, you're still going to be in trouble if you aren't paying attention. Well, and, and I think the, the the, 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 there's another important point to consider is that you have to look at the population you're studying, and the average American has the sad diet. You know, the standard American diet is just a, a atrocious. Right. You know, they're eating tons of processed foods and sugars. Two thirds of them are overweight, so they're not really have in any way, shape, or form have an idealized gut gut function to absorb this nutrition when they're eating. So, it, right. you, you know, right. and I would say the vast majority of the people listening to this interview are not in that category. So you know, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. So they're they're in a, they're a whole different stage. I mean, when when I lecture at a longevity conference, or and I'm sure when you lecture, you see people in your clinic. These are these are totally different individuals. You look up at an, an audience of a thousand people, and you can probably count on a single hand or two hands the number of people overweight. So, right. So it's a totally right. different community.